It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. One of the most outspoken critics of Chairman Mao's cultural revolution in China was a young poet and journalist named Lin Jia. She was a Christian convert and then a member of the Communist Party, then an enemy of the state who paid for her opposition with her life. She was executed by firing squad. And her story would have vanished, along with the lives of two million other Chinese who were killed during the Cultural Revolution. But she left a record. She wrote her witness in her own blood. In this episode, you'll encounter one of Christianity's most remarkable martyrs of the 20th century. Professor Shi Lian is our guest. He's professor of world Christianity at Duke Divinity School, and we're talking about his remarkable new book, Blood Letters, The Untold Story of Lin Cha, a Martyr in Mao's China. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. Shi Lian joins us today at the Maxwell Institute. He's a professor of world Christianity at Duke Divinity School, and he wrote a fascinating book that I give my highest recommendation. This book is called Blood Letters, The Untold Story of Lin Cha, a Martyr in Mao's China. She, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. And I should also let people know you're giving a guest lecture. That's going to happen later today. So by the time this episode comes out, people will be able to watch that lecture on the Maxwell Institute's YouTube channel as well. Let's start off, Xi, by painting a picture of China's political environment when Lin Chao was born in 1932. Lin Chao was really born into a turbulent time. It was a post-dynastic China. The uh, imperial system that lasted you know, for some 2,000 years, had just collapsed back in 1911. So it was in the uh, post-dynastic transitional period with a lot of warlordism and foreign encroachment. And uh, the year she was born, 1932, China had just recently come together under, nominally came together under the, the rule of Kuomintang, the nationalist government. And so it was a time of rebuilding. The, the nationalist was trying to rebuild the country, which is why her father took the examination, passed examinations, and then became, was chosen as the county magistrate. And these examinations were basically directed by the nationalist government to, That's right. to basically say, we want to find the people in China who can help lead this new direction for the That's country. Right. They right? were trying to modernize country, yeah. in, including modernizing its the, the bureaucracy. Yeah. And I mean, this was an enormous task. China is an enormous country. And to bring together a country under a particular governing body, uh, it seems it seems like an enormous task. What were her parents like? Were they progressive minded? Were they traditional? What kind of things would they have instilled in her in her childhood? Well, both her parents were quite progressive. Her father was also quite steeped in the Chinese tradition, traditional culture. And that's where a lot of Lin Zhao's influence came from. She was steeped in the Confucian classics and all that, and that very much came from her father. But on the other hand, her father was also educated in this new university, and uh, he was studying things like constitutionalism. I was very much hoping to bring that to China, and the failure that her father experienced also reflected the frustrations that China was having at the time, trying to rebuild, to build this modern state. Yeah, Lin Jia's story herself isn't the only tragic story in the book, obviously, and, and the fate that her father eventually succumbs to is, is a tragedy as well. I wanted to you to mention as well, as, as Lin Jia is being raised here, she's in a family that's pretty well off then. She has educated parents. What was the class system like? Where would she be situated in terms of class? She was clearly born into a uh, well-to-do family, uh, her father being a county magistrate, briefly meant that they did have some resources, and uh, her mother was quite an accomplished woman, quite an activist, a social activist. And then eventually her mother also became quite a successful businesswoman. She ran a, uh, a, a bus company. So that was what enabled the family to send her to this uh, mission school, Laura Haygood Mem Memorial School for Girls. It was a, a school for the privileged class. Yeah, this is a school, Laura Haygood Memorial School, not the kind of name you would expect for a school in China. What was that school about? This is in 1947 when she was sent here, so she was 15, she was 15, 15 yes. years old. Yeah, so what was that about? Well, the typical image we have of mission schools in China from the 19th century was those mission schools for poor people. 
they had to attract children from poor families to these mission schools to be exposed to Christian、uh, influence. But that's not no longer the case in the early 20th century, and certainly not the case with Laura Haygood. It was a、uh, a school for the for the upper class. Only rich people could send their children to this school, and many actually many. Children came from non-Christian families just because of the reputation of the school. So this would basically be a Christian mission organization that would set up in China, and part of their efforts would be to to educate Chinese people and hopefully to seek converts as well, perhaps through those efforts. That's right. Initially, it was set up with the goal of cultivating a kind of modern Christian womanhood. In contrast to traditional Chinese womanhood, because in in traditional Chinese society, women were not Given the opportunity to receive formal education, so this was quite new. Its curriculum was very new, but of course,、uh, Christian influence was also important. But it's important to, to recognize that by the time Lin Zhao entered Laura Haygood in 1947, the、uh, chapel attendance, religious activities, and、uh, conversion had all been made optional for about two decades. So she could perfectly. Go through the, the entire education without becoming a Christian. So she, it was her choice to be baptized as a Christian there. Yeah, and we'll talk about why she made that choice. And before we do, with these Christian organizations, how did they get into China to begin with? Was this was it controversial at first? Was there resistance from the people of China or from the nationalist government? What was the thinking about bringing in these foreign groups to come into the country? Yeah, it's a long story. It goes back to the 1880s, when this Southern Methodist missionary by the name of Laura Haygood, and she herself had benefited from women's education. She graduated from、uh, Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia, and that was the very first college for women in the world. And so, having benefited herself from that, she wanted to pass along the benefits of、uh, education for women to the Chinese. And so she sailed out to China in the 1880s. But at the time, it was still in the late period of the Qing Dynasty. And given the unequal treaties, the Qing government did not have much choice. When mission schools were established,、uh, they were established in, in Shanghai, and that became the first school that she founded. Became quite a prestigious school for girls. And they just continued the tradition after she died in 1900. Then they built this Laura Haygood in Suzhou, two three years later. So it seems like I mean we're setting up a point of tension here, which is Christianity entered the country at a time when it was possible for them to do that. Not necessarily because the people who would become the rulers of China would have wanted them there, and that's going to become a problem、um, as as China moves forward. Okay, so so Lin Jia is at the Laura Haygood Memorial School for Girls. This is a Christian school. She doesn't necessarily have to convert. This is about helping educate women. This is about modernizing. This is even about changing bodily practices for women in China as well. Things、that's、like、right. overcoming foot binding and、that's、things、right. like that. Yeah. What kind of changes? Like describe foot binding. You see from some of the historical pictures, photos we have of. Laura Haygood and and the, and the girls there. One thing is, is quite clear: no girls there had bound feet. Even though in the early 20th century there were still women with bound feet, but they, the missionaries, of course, got rid of of foot binding. So they enjoyed. What was that practice like? What would they do? Oh, it's it's a terrible practice that went back more than a thousand years, when the、uh, the ideal was to bind women's feet. So that they will be no more than three inches long. So basically, you have to break the arch for that to happen because the feet will continue to grow. And foot binding happens at about the age of three. And、uh, ironically, it's the mother who used to do that. But in any case,、uh, so that tradition had lasted just unimaginably for like a thousand years. And there was the missionaries who came. Who then militated against that kind of of torture, but that was not. Realize this torture for so many years. So it seems like Lin Jia is really in a good spot here. She has a family who's well off. Yes, she's going to a prestigious school, and she decides to become baptized as a Christian. How did she reach that decision? I wish we had more information about that. Lin Jia, in her prison writings, talked about the Christian humanitarian influence, and she talks about the efficiency, the, this idea of freedom that she、um, she was exposed to in mission schools. But she did not quite explain why she she baptized. What we do know 
is that she was baptized by her missionary teacher, one of her missionary teachers. And another thing we, we do know is that she sank much deeper roots than she realized at the time. She was only spent two years at, in Lower Haygood. Uh, we know how deep that influence, Christian influence, was on her only from her later prison writings because later in prison cells she was deprived of any religious reading, no Bible, no hymn book, but she was able to recall those biblical passages and hymns from the time when she was in, in Laura Haygood. And when she was baptized, would that decision have been considered a radical one? Would people around her friends or people that are associated with her family or maybe even her parents, would they have seen a conversion to Christianity as sort of a betrayal of her Chinese heritage or as something that was politically subversive at all? We do know that many parents who send their young daughters to this kind of school or boys to or boys' schools, they would sometimes tell their, their, their children, I mean, you can just go ahead and get your Western education, but do not get Western God. You know? mm. So it is quite possible that Lin Zhao's parents were disappointed or upset by, by the conversion, but apparently they did not prevent her baptism. So she's baptized Christian, she's going to Laura Haygood, but soon enough, Lin Jia is also now drawn to communism. And at age 16, she secretly joined the Communist Party of China, and we'll say the CCP from here on out. So the CCP is the Communist Party of China. How did she get drawn to communism? Well, we know that the Communist Party at the time, in the 1940s, was very active in their underground operation and they operated their cells in uh, lots of schools. They targeted young children, and um, they knew how excitable young people were and, 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 and radical. So they used these communist cells to um, bring some communist party members to become teachers in schools, in, in mission schools. And apparently, Lin Zhao became a communist under the influence of some of these teachers. So they arranged for her to become a, an underground member of the Communist Party. And how did the party fit into China's culture at that time? Was it like a recognized political party? What was it? Well, she joined the Communist Party in the summer of 1948. That was toward the last years of the Chinese Civil War. So the Nationalists and the Communists were fighting out after the Second World War was over and Japanese occupation was over. So to become a communist was to, to put it mildly, to join the insurgency. Mm. And if you are caught, then uh, you'll be thrown into prison. And in some cases, you may be killed. In fact, Lin Zhao's uncle, who was a communist activist, was murdered for being a communist. What about Christians? Uh, what were the Christians thinking about the Communist Party? Were they trying to stay out of the factions? Or were they trying to stay out of the Civil War? Or did they side with one or the other? The established church and the missionaries in general, by and large, were very skeptical about communism. Uh, some were sympathetic with communist goals, but they mostly were opposed to its violent means. And so in mission schools, for instance, the school administrators and, and the teachers were warned against communism. And in my book, I quote a passage from Lin Zhao's teacher, one of her missionary teachers, who used this metaphor of a frying pan, said because the people in, in China were so desperate to get out of this fire that was burning in China, they would be happy to, to get into a frying pan that was communism. And um, so that was the general suspicion that they had of communism. But on the other hand, there were some people within the Christian circles who became very radical, who saw communism as taking people even further than Christian reformism. Mm. So it's complicated. It's a really fascinating time. She's sort of right in the middle of all of these changes that are happening. And she joins the party secretly, which is a radical decision. And she's very dedicated to the CCP. But just as the party is starting to overtake the Nationalist Party, her membership gets revoked. And you talk about this in the book. How did this happen to her? Well, because of her activities for the party, she was probably printing a mimeograph propaganda, those uh, leaflets for the party. And she also got active 
in in other ways. So for combination of reasons, she was blacklisted. And the she was being dangerous. Is that kind right. of it? Like, that's, hey, careful now. That's right. She was blacklisted by the um, by the nationalist, the police, and so she was actually the party decided that her life was in danger. So the party gave the order hmm. for those young student uh, communist party members to evacuate Suzhou, but Lin Zhao ignored that. She thought that her because her mother was a representative to the national congress. It's the um, the equivalent of a congresswoman. She thought she was safe, so she just ignored the party's order, and the party would tolerate no disobedience. Hmm. So, because of that disobedience, her membership was revoked. That must have been kind of heartbreaking for her. This was something that she had really dedicated herself to, and even though she was young, she was very passionate about this That's and felt like she was doing things for the good of the party. But because she didn't follow the party's sort of instructions. Then she's kicked out. That's right, and it was particularly traumatic for her because she lost her party membership just on the eve of the communist victory. So when the party came to power, there she was, having devoted herself to the revolutionary cause. Now she has lost her party membership. And what's interesting is losing her membership didn't make her persona non grata with the party. It didn't. It didn't mean that the party was going to prevent her from being involved in certain ways. In fact, she's sent to the South Jiangsu Journalism Vocational School. So the party still has an interest in what she's doing, and in fact, sends her to a journalism school. And you have a chapter here called "Exchanging Leather Shoes for Straw Sandals." That's the name of this. Chapter. So, give us an idea of why the party sent her to this school and what she was going to do there. Well, as you can imagine, a party coming to power, they needed all kinds of talents, and uh, the party has been very good at propaganda. And the party knew that it needs to train propagandists, so they created these journalism schools to train not just reporters. Propagandists, but also as fermenters of the revolution, so they would also do the job of spreading the gospel of communism throughout China. So, regardless of your backgrounds, in fact, in the early days of the communist victory, they retain many of the、um, government officials from the previous government. They retain many of the talents. The, the communists were quite pragmatic at the time. So, regardless of their political affiliation, they won the the, the best talents, and they rec recruited the best talents. So Lin Zhao was recruited, and so if she performs well, ostensibly she could rejoin the party.、Right? That's right, and that was actually Lin Zhao's goal. She wanted to rejoin the party, and so and so she re sort of redoubled her efforts to、yeah. work hard for the party. Yeah, so she's got to prove herself. What about the title "Exchanging Leather Shoes for Straw Sandals"? What does that represent? That's Lin Zhao's own language. She used that、uh, later in her letter to People's Daily to describe the kind of, of changes that、um, she went through. At the time, many educated young people like Lin Zhao they exchanged their leather shoes for straw sandals when they gave up their privileged social status and their.、Um, Their comfortable life to go into the countryside to do the work for the party, and that was particularly a reference to the land reform program that the party had unleashed. It was a program of land redistribution, grains requisitions、uh, for the party, and so she did that. And to go to the countryside, you take off your leather shoes and and you change into straw sandals. And here she points to the irony of what happens on the other end, as those communist cadres with peasant backgrounds. They change out of their straw sandals and and step into leather shoes. Yeah, so there's this dynamic in the book where they're trying to flatten society. They're trying to bring greater equality, sort of power to the masses. And part of this then is the elite people stepping down and and humbling themselves and seeking greater equality by giving up some of their privilege. But then you also have the flip side of people that come into power, start to understand what it's like to have power, and and kind of become extreme the other direction. Absolutely, and in this we now catch glimpses of the irony of this revolution that proclaims that it's going to make an egalitarian society, but in fact, the communist cadres they were quickly becoming a new ruling class. Does it seem strange to you that the party would still, for someone like Lin Zhao, that the party would still seek, sort of use her in the way that they did? 
it seems that, that they did trust people like Lin Chao at this time, that there was hope for them to rejoin. They didn't just exile them right now. They didn't get rid of them at this point. That's right. And, and part of the reason for that, and not just be, because the, the party was being pragmatic, but also because young people like Lin Chao, they really wanted to help the party rebuild the country. To, to build this uh, perfect you know, utopian society that the, prom- the party had promised. And what was preventing her from rejoining it then? What are the dynamics that she faced? Why, given that she was spending her time, she went to the vocational school, she was going to the land reform movement after school so that she could get down in the earth with the people and, and help do these land redistribution projects and educate peasants and things. Why not just let her rejoin? Yeah, once the party took power... It did want to raise the threshold for joining the party, so they wanted to make sure that they re- recruit the um, those who were most fervently supportive of the party, those whose thinking had been remade, thoughts had been uh, sort of molded, and Lin Zhao failed that test, that last test, while she was completely willing to sacrifice herself to support the, the party. Actually, she had to work cope with tuberculosis when she joined the, the land reform team. Some, sometimes she was running a fever, but she refused to stop working. Uh, she still carried on her work out of utter devotion to the party. But then what the party demanded was total surrender of your own thinking to the party's thinking and this unquestioning support for the party. And that Lin Zhao, that's the test that, that Lin Zhao failed. And one of the ways she failed that test, uh, that she quickly noticed, and then was quick, and also was uh, willing to point out the hypocrisy of some of the party, uh, the carders. And uh, it was very common for s- some of those carders with peasant backgrounds. Now they are in, in, in power. Now they have many the, of these city girls working under them. They took advantage of these, these, these city girls. They've, many of them would abandon their, their wives back in the countryside and, and marry these city girls. And Lin Zhao pointed out, the, she, she, she confronted her own team leader, work team leader, and expose that kind of hypocrisy. How would she? Would she confront them in person? Was she writing things? How was she going about? She confronted them with, with in person with a lot of sarcasm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that did not go well. With yeah. Her. <laughs> Give some examples of that because it really shines through in some of the, the things in the book where she had a sharp edge to her that, that could be pretty to the point in a way that would make people uncomfortable. Yeah, she, at one point, uh, it was close to midnight, and uh, she went to her friend's dorm, uh, the, 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 the girls' women's quarters, and then she found a, uh, one of the, the male team leaders lying in, in the bed of one, of one of his girls. And then that person, when, when, I mean, he was surprised uh, by, by Lin Zhao coming. And You're not supposed to be in here. <laughs> <laughs> and so he started chiding Lin Zhao. What are you doing here? You don't belong to this particular team. Why are you here? And Lin Zhao said, well, but it's not as bad as a male showing up in, in, a, in a women's quarters at, at midnight. Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't very shy, it seems like. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) So she's being prevented from rejoining the party. She has critiques to make, but she still still wants to be a communist at this point. That's right. It's really striking how much she wanted to believe in the party. She she wrote to her her dear friends at the time that even though these party carders had sort of failed me, but the, the party has not... I still want to believe in the party. Yeah, she would kind of say like, well, the leaders of the party aren't perfect, but the party itself is, That's right. is perfect. And, and she maintained her allegiance that way. That's right. The party is above reproach and Chairman Mao is above reproach. And she would say that she would silently, silently call out the name of our dear father. Yeah, Chairman um, Mao. Which was Chairman yeah. Mao. That's interesting for a Christian to do that, too. It seems like if she came to that point that she's towing the party line that strongly, that seems to contradict with Christian values of, like, worshiping God and and that sort of thing. I mean, in a way, Mao becomes a god of sorts to members of the party. That's right. Mao was becoming a god for all of China. And what happened to Lin Zhao's Christian faith? Now, we have—there's no evidence that she ever gave up her faith. 
what seems to have happened, she did drift away from from the church in this in the early 1950s when she was fervently pursuing the revolution. But uh, it's also quite clear she never stopped being a Christian, because later on the um, we will see that later on when she was denounced as a as a writer, we see her back in the church with her with her fiance. Mm. That's Shi Lian. We're talking with him today about the book Blood Letters, the untold story of Lin Chao, a martyr in Mao's China. And she is a professor of world Christianity at Duke Divinity School. And he's visiting us today uh, at the Maxwell Institute here at Brigham Young University. All right, Shi, let's talk about what happens to her next. She's doing work as a newspaper editor and a reporter. Now, what is that work like for her as she's left the vocational school and now she's actually working as an editor and reporter as not a, and, and not yet a member of the party? That's right. She worked as a reporter and editor for a local newspaper, and her job was to serve as a propagandist. Did they call it that? Did they use that word? or Actually, the party was not shy about the word propaganda. And there is actually a Chinese, there's a department of propaganda. Did it not have the same edge to it? Like the connotation to us today, obviously, is like propaganda is just misinformation meant to mislead people. Did propaganda become that word because it was originally used in a different context? It seems weird. In other words, it just seems weird that they would call it that. It's like, hey, this is the department of, of baloney. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and again, it, it's quite striking that the... Um, that the party has never been shy about their term, and the, uh, they're still the propaganda department. <laughs> <laughs> did the word originally have different meanings, or did they just say, oh, we're just going to call it propaganda, that's what it is? I think the reason that the term propaganda was hardly ever a problem for the Chinese is that there has not been this uh, Western and Enlightenment tradition, at least not the mainstream tradition of individuals thinking for themselves. So there is this idea, and that is, if the Communist Party has the truth, what's the problem with, with those uh, holders of truth propagating okay. the truth? So yeah, just propagation. Okay, good. That, that, was, that one was hard for me to wrap my head around. So, so she's working as a newspaper editor and a reporter, and she doesn't do that for very long, though. She's going to move to Peking University in 1954. Why the transition for her? Well, we, we can see that initially, when she graduated from high school, she could have gone to college directly. She chose not to. She chose instead, and it was to great disappointment of her parents, she chose to go to a party-run journalism school. But eventually, I think, once things settled down, she, she realized her own passion. She had an extraordinary training in, in traditional Chinese literature, and which is why she eventually left the newspaper to sit for the examination in 1954 and then and then she was admitted because of her grades and it must have been a really exciting time for her she's taking a step forward she's probably feels like she's getting closer to rejoining the party but she's also noticing that the party's becoming increasingly totalitarian she starts to become disturbed by some of the things instead of seeing one of the leaders in a woman's dorm room she's starting to become aware of greater atrocities. What's happening? What's the party doing now? Well, that took her a while to realize. Now, in 1954, when she was admitted to Peking University, and that was the, the premier university in China, it was the most prestigious university. And so that was a high point in her life. And the young people were so full of idealism and uh, confidence. And, and so she continued, she, she throve. In, in college as a poet, as a journalist, and, um, and all went well until 1957. That was the turning point, and that came because of what Mao had done at the time. Mao, back in 1956, had launched this so-called Hundred Flowers campaign, uh, calling on intellectuals to speak out, to criticize the party, to help the party improve its work, at first, intellectuals were relatively silent and cautious. But then in early 1957, Mao again promised intellectuals, all of you, speak out, and you will not be punished for no matter what kinds of criticisms you make of the party. This seems hard because for all this time, everyone's 
pledged allegiance to the party and seen it as perfect, basically seen it as this great thing. And so it seems like Mao's trying to correct that a little bit. He's trying to say, okay, maybe we've gone a little bit too far. We, we need criticism. In fact, criticism can help us. So speak your minds. What do you see that's going wrong? This can help the party improve. Come on out. Give us your best. Did he mean that? There's, there's actually a historical sort of controversy over, over that. One school of thought is that Mao sort of was muddling through his, this, this program. At first, he um, invited people to criticize. He was very confident that uh, those criticisms would be mild. But then when the criticism became much harsher than he realized, then he was shocked. And then, then he, he, he turned back. What and, kind of and criticisms were they making? Like, what were people saying that crossed the line for him? Oh, the, the, the kind of comments and criticisms that, that crossed the line came from, or, or they all came from intellectuals, some from college students, from, from Ding Zhao's university, some from the so-called democratic parties. And a lot of that focused on the parties uh, was increasingly a totalitarian kind of control. And some from the democratic parties call on the party to, uh, to share power which the party had promised before it, 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 before 1949. So that's the kind of criticism that, that caught Mao by surprise. The other kind of explanation is that, as Mao himself said, he said it was an open conspiracy. Mao knew all along what he was going to do. So he invited people to criticize. He said, well, let's entice those snakes out of their lair. And once they come out, we can kill them. Yeah, so two schools of thought. One, that he really wanted some criticism, then it got out of control, and he decided, oh, that's the, the fire's too hot, let's tamp this down. The other is that he thought, this is a way to flush out critics. This is a way to Absolutely. have people show their true colors. We'll find out who the true believers in the party are, and then we'll be able to separate them out in, in terrible ways. So, so Lin Zhao is starting to see the Hundred Flowers, which is a lovely name for a, what became a terrible situation. She's starting at this point to become more disenchanted with the party itself, it seems, for the first time. Is that right? That was the turning point. And it took her a while. At first, it was, it was hard for her to believe that that was what, what was happening. She was hoping that the party would correct its mistakes because it, once the hundred flowers turned within a few weeks of Mao's promise, you know, t telling people that uh, you don't need to worry about your criticism, you know, within weeks of that, Mao had turned around and then then started to crack down on, on these intellectuals. Like making arrests. Making arrests. Some yeah. were sent to prison. Others were sent to, um, you know, labor camps. And, and Lin Zhao was really shocked by that. And eventually, by, 19, by January of 1958, uh, she herself was uh, put on that dreaded list. Was there something in particular she had done that landed her on that list? And they were called rightists, like That's people right. on the right. Did she, what did she do? And it became what was known as the anti-rightist campaign. So she became a rightist. Now, to, be, to become a right, rightist, it's filled with ironies and, and, and it was almost like a farce in, in some cases because Mao set a quota for the percentage of people who are rightists. Yeah, this is like very bureaucratic. He's like, there are this many. We need to find them. That's right. Mao said somewhere between one percent and 10% were rightist. So the party, uh, the those uh, functionaries, the leaders said, okay, if Mao has said that, then, then there should be 5%. Yep. So they make sure that you, you will catch 5% of rightists in every university, um, every work unit. And Lin Zhao's, in Lin Zhao's case, two reasons why she was added to that list as, uh, of rightists. One, she had spoken out against the party and in support of her fellow students who had called for democracy. So that was one reason. So she was uh, actually denounced by some as the um, this black hand behind the scene. Yeah, uh, she had helped publish something, right? There was actually a publication that she had had her hand in. That's right. And she, she supported her friends who put out these uh, big posters. Yeah. So that was one reason. Uh, another reason seems to be that um, the Peking University, by January of 1958, had not quite uh, met the quota that Mao set. So they needed a few more mm. writers. So Lin Zhao was added as, a, uh, as one mm. of those. What was her initial reaction to that? She could not believe that the party had turned against her that way. Had the party had betrayed her and had betrayed all these other well-meaning students that way. Because these people were really loyalists. They re were so loyal in the criticism of the party. 
So the the shock was such that she attempted suicide. She uh, she scraped the uh, tops from the matches and, and swallowed them. And, and yeah, she had matches. She thought this could poison her. And, that's right. And then and she survived. And then not only did she survive, but intellectual life in China all around her is changing. What happened? They call this the Great Leap Forward, which is such an ironic name. That's right. Uh, once the uh, intellectuals were all silenced, then Mao could do whatever he wanted to do without encountering any significant uh, opposition, which is what happened in 1958 when Mao launched this great leap forward, trying to, in, in Mao's own thinking, trying to overtake Great Britain in this industrial pr production and uh, to catch up with the United States. And that'd be by providing food and products and exports and a strong economy, presumably. It was uh, through a sort of two-fold effort. In the countryside, it wants to collectivize go through this complete agricultural collectivization. So then the, the party state would then take control of all the grains. And so that was one. And then it also wants to industrialize at the same time. And Mao had this very crude thinking of way to measure industrial progress. That's the tonnage of steel that you can produce. And since China did not have the capacity to produce steel, he called on people to um, build their backyard furnaces to produce steel. And so in the meantime, Lin Zhao had been sent to this, what was called the uh, re-education through labor uh, program. Basically break their spirits, make them do hard labor until, they, right. until they change. To become re-educated and to be humi humiliated and to become re-educated. Re so their thinking would be purged, their thoughts would be purged. Lin Zhao thoughts weren't going to be easily perched, though, <laughs> as this book shows. So, But she ends up in prison as a result of this. How does she end up in prison? Well, she started writing. When she saw her friends being sent to camps and prisons and punished, she embarked on writing. She, she wrote two long poems. One is called Seagull, and the other is entitled A Day in Prometheus Passion. And these two long poems in both these poems, she chastised Mao for his cruelty. And she also mocked Mao in A Day in Prometheus Passion. She mocked Mao as, as this villainous Zeus who was filled with impotent rage. Yeah, she's drawing on like classical That's right. literature to paint Mao as this. Yes. Is this evil god? So that's speak. right. Yeah. And 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 in that poem, Mao was the Zeus, and he 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 told Prometheus that you have to uh, take back the fire that you've stolen from heaven. That this fire of freedom, you have it to extinguish that fire. And uh, Lin Zhao said, "How could that happen?" You know. I mean, Lin Zhao was brilliant. I think what she's doing here is she's saying, "Oh, you you think you're God? Here here you are. You are. Here's the God that you are." She's. It's not just. It's not just insults. It's not. It's a very reasoned, thoughtful, informed, and biting critique that she's making, and that that doesn't go over well. So she's imprisoned as a result of that. Now your book is called Blood Letters because when she's imprisoned, she can't stop writing once she's there, and she starts to write things in blood. What's that about? Well, when she was arrested, and she was make to go through this thought reform program. But she was also being interrogated. The reason for her arrest, one of that was the her writing, her poems, but also she had collaborated with other writers in launching this underground journal called A Spark of Fire. So when she was interrogated, she was presumably part of this counter-revolutionary clique, and she had to write the, these confessions to expose other uh, counter-revolutionaries. So as she was going through this interrogation, they at one point they took away her writing instruments. So she has nothing to write except her own blood. And so how would she do? How, how did it actually work? Well, she pricked herself, pricked her fingers with whatever sharp objects she could lay her hands on, a sharpened bamboo, sometimes her hair clip, or even the, the plastic handle of her toothbrush. After it was after she um, was ground against the concrete floor, and so use, using that, she pricked her fingers and, and wrote. And she would write these letters and critiques. She would write some poetry. One of the things you mentioned too is that this isn't an idea that she just came up with on her own. That blood writing had a history. 
That's right. It goes all the way back as far back as at least to the sixth century A.D. and has to do with this tradition of Buddhist devotees, sort of manifesting their devotion, religious devotion, through their blood writings, as an act of utmost sincerity and devotion. But eventually, it sort of bled into popular culture, and so. Lin Zhao was quite aware of that tradition of blood writing as a way to show one's utmost sincerity. And as she's doing this, how is she being treated by the guards? How, what is prison life like? Well, that's it's, it's full of irony. Also, what she did caught the guards by surprise. Not only did she write, uh, did she do blood writings? She wrote protest letters at the time when she was in、uh, under torture and interrogation in the Shanghai Number、no. One Detention House. She wrote blood letters addressed to the mayor of Shanghai, protesting her this unjust imprisonment, and she did it in her own blood. So she handed the letters to the guards, and the guards did not know what to do with it. She said the guard told her eventually, "We cannot send this in the mail." So she plopped it back. The the guards plopped it back into her her cell through this little window in in her in a very heavy wooden door. And it seemed through her tortures, because they they would torture. They did these horrible ways of handcuffing people, handcuffing arms behind the back in in straining positions, and leaving them that way for extended periods of time, and and other methods of torture. That at times it seemed like Lin Chao even started to lose her grip on reality. Sometimes, in fact, this mayor that you mentioned, he he died. He died kind of mysteriously or, or unexpectedly, and Lin Chao heard about this because she was. They would give them the news in in the prison as part of their reeducation or that's or, right or whatnot. She heard about this and then started to kind of. It seemed like she was losing her grip on reality, thinking that she had some kind of relationship with this mayor. That's right. That happened at the time when she was in solitary confinement. She was in this、uh, tiny cell, the size of a double bed, with no windows. For about six months, but even during that period, the inmates still had to undergo、uh, political reeducation. So they would still have newspaper, and so she read about the death of this mayor called Ke Qingshi in the newspaper, and then she began to suspect that Mao had murdered the mayor because she she imagined that her lead blood letters to the mayor. Had landed on his desk, and he had exploded in rage over this、um, mistreatment of a of an innocent intellectual, and had protested to Mao. And Mao then, out of jealousy, and may, maybe Mao was was entertaining this this sexual、um, dreams, fantasies toward Lin Zhao, and Mao had she imagined that Mao had murdered Ke Qingshi. So as a result of that, she performed what was called a spirit marriage, and there's also. Uh, goes back to the Chinese tradition when the, a, a woman would then be married to the、uh, to the spirit of of a deceased man, and that's what she did. She performed that ritual of spirit marriage in in prison. Yeah, there's an interesting hybrid of her Chinese culture and her Christian culture beginning to come together during her time in prison. Because while she's there, she's also beginning to really let her Christianity come out again. And in in her letters, I actually have an excerpt from one of the declarations that she wrote that I would like you to read. It's it's from the book here. This is kind of part of her religious manifesto here. Yes, and this passage is from her letter to People's Daily to the editors of People's Daily. This is the People's newspaper, which was、yeah. the party's mouthpiece. Part, yeah, and she wrote that after she was sentenced to twenty years in in prison for her writing. And、uh, she was protesting against what she called the tyranny and slavery of Chinese communism, but she was also making it making it very clear that her resistance would be nonviolent because she was a Christian, and so that brought us to、um, to this point. She wrote, "As a Christian, my life belongs to my God. In order to stick to my path, or rather my line, the line of a servant of God, the political line of Christ." This young person paid a grievous price. I have come to see more clearly and deeply the many terrifying and shocking evils committed by your demonic political party. I grieved and wept for them. Yet even when I touched the darkest, the most terrifying, the bloodiest, 
and the most savage center of your power, the core of evil, I still glimpsed, I did not completely overlook, the occasional sparks of humanity in you. Then I cried, in even greater anguish, I cried for your blood-smeared souls which are unable to rid themselves of evil and are dragged by its terrifying weight ever deeper into the swamp of death. Most likely, you will feel quite indifferent when you read this line, but as I write this, hot tears are rushing into my eyes. Gentlemen, those who enslave others can never be free. What a merciless but certain truth in your case. That's a beautiful and, and horrible writing. Did you translate the I letters did. yourself? So as you're doing that, how did that, how did that affect you personally? Because th this is such a difficult story to tell. Did it bother you? I've spoken with people who have written on like the Holocaust or other things, and they would have dreams. They would have bad dreams or they would kind of carry it with them. How was it for you? I had, I was really caught in with all these mixed feelings. On the one hand, this was so depressing and reading through her, all her prison writings was so depressing to see the kind of torture, the cruelty that she was subjected to. But on the other hand, there were passages like this that really up, you know, lifts one's spirit. You know, I felt as if I was I was able to glimpse at the the boundary of the human spirit and its capacity for endurance, for hope, and for compassion like this. And so I also found it to be very beautiful. And you talk a little bit about how she was even aware of, of some of the other injustices globally. She wasn't just focused on China. She, she knew about John F. Kennedy, for example, and, and hoped that he was kind of this beacon of freedom that, that she admired and looked to. What are some other what are other, some other comparisons that you would draw? People that have written in similar ways, Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Martin Luther King Jr. How, how do her prison writings compare to some of these other famous prison writings? I do compare Lin Zhao to um, people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The Russian. That's right. Yeah. And one thing that's striking about these people is what their Christian faith enable them to take the moral stand. And of course, you know, Martin Luther King uh, comes to mind also. And particularly for Ling Zhao, at her time, we have to recognize that there was this whole generation of Chinese intellectuals who were silenced after the anti-rightist campaign. Many of them have been exposed to Western you know, Enlightenment ideas, but we have not seen any other examples of people holding out and sticking to their beliefs. Uh, I think what makes the difference here is that Lin Zhao's Christian belief gave her the kind of moral convictions, these unshaken moral convictions, to see herself doing this, not just as a matter of enlightened, enlightenment beliefs in, in, in human rights and, and democracy, but also as defending, as she, in her own words, my God-given human rights. So I think it is that faith that really supported her, that carried her through this kind of struggle. It, it was inspiring to me and, and difficult for me because that very faith then also brought her to the point where she was going to be put to death. It, it's like if she would have bended, it's possible that she could have escaped this fate. In fact, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but there's one part where she basically says, I'm like an egg being thrown up against a rock. Yeah, like it, it's not going to <laughs> break that rock. But you know what? Maybe there's going to be egg after egg after egg after egg for however many times it takes and that eventually something might change. That's right. That's right. And on the one hand, she was quite conscious of the futility of her opposition to communism. But then on the other hand, she saw this as, the, uh, as her Christian duty. Since this is the political line of Christ, uh, as a Christian, she had no choice but to stay with this. And then toward the end of her prison time and in her letter to, to her mother, she, she, she said, well, actually, she said the same thing to, to her mother about 
the importance of of her faith in in her opposition. But in her letter to the People's Daily, she actually said, she, "If God wants wants me to live on, I know I will be able to live on." You know, with this twenty year prison sentence, you know. But if God wants me to become a willing martyr, you know, I see it as my honor to become one. And how did that eventually happen? Well, eventually she was martyred. Now, for for most people under her circumstances, if you are given twenty year prison sentence, what you would do is to bend, and uh, you would just accept this thought reform. And in fact, in my book, I talk about a um, sort of a parallel story, and it's a story of a, a Yale educated Shakespearean scholar. Who was a literature professor at, at, at Shanghai、uh, Fudan University? He was actually put into the same prison as Lin Zhao, and so there was one point at, during the Cultural Revolution when he told the guard that I'm I'm too busy, I have no time to write my thought confessions, which every prisoner should write, inmate should write. He said I have no time to write my confessions because I'm so busy copying Chen Mao's works every day. <laughs> so that's the kind of route that most people chose、mm-hmm. for, for their own survival, and Lin Zhao did not take that road. Is it possible that there were other Lin Chaos that that are lost to history? It, it almost seems happenstantial. That I mean, it seems amazing, really, that her writings survive. It is possible that there are voices like Lin Chaos that we have not uncovered. On the other hand, we are now fifty years after, more than fifty years after the outbreak of the Cultural Revolution, and we have not seen anything like that.、Hmm. We have seen some so-called dissident voices of, of of dissidents from the Cultural Revolution, and but those were the kind of criticisms directed at at the party or, or Mao for deviating from true communism.、Mm. So they did not constitute the kind of the, the actual the kind of political dissent that we find in Lin Zhao because Lin Zhao. Because of her Christian belief, she rejected communism. It's it's a completely rejected communist ideology. And as a result of that, the people that were overseeing her her prison sentence came to recognize that that that's how it was going to be, and so they pursued through their legal channels an execution order, and she was she was shot. Yes, but also China at the time had descended further into chaos. So what happened after 1967 was the Those revolutionary committees took over, and they typically were made up of the army personnel. So they took control of the, the prison system, the legal system, also, and、uh, so they did sort of a perfunctory、yeah. you know, process, legal process. But then they changed her twenty-year sentence to death penalty. It's interesting that they even had to do that, though. I mean, they didn't just say, you know what, we're we're done with this. Take her out and take care of it. They they still tried to do this pretense of, That's of right. order. That's right. They still wanted to put on this, this facade、yeah. of legal process. Yeah, that Shi Lian. We're talking with him today about the book Blood Letters: The Untold Story of Lin Zhao, a Martyr in Mao's China. And Shi Lian is a professor of world Christianity at Duke Divinity School. So, Shi, you've spent how many years on this project? I became aware of Lin Zhao's story in 2011, and then I started researching this book in 2012, and so the book got published last year. So you've spent a lot of time with her、um, through her writings and and digging through whatever records you could find. But if you could sit down with Lin Zhao, what questions remain for you? What would you want to know from her? You know, one thing I was really struck. By in, in in my research, was the kind of hope that she kept up. You know, in her in in some of her last writings, she to her mother, her blood letters to her to her mother. She she told her mother how she would like a future collection of her prison writings to be called. She told her mother, "I like to, I'm I'm going to call them freedom writings." So the, if I were given a chance to to interview Lin Zhao to ask her, I would ask her, "How could you have that kind of hope? What gave you that kind of hope? It, it was insanity, because every bit of every single piece of writing of the the inmates did would be confiscated. There were these searches, unannounced searches of of cells all the time. You know, guards would show up. Everybody would say, 'Stand up.'" And then they were searched through the inmates' belongings and and took away everything. In face of that, how could she believe that her writings would survive? And what's amazing that, of course, they did survive. 
Yeah, how? How did they? That's another irony、uh, in that story, and that is this totalitarian system was also so rigid that nobody had felt that they had the、um, the freedom to take initiative to do things to do whatever makes sense. So in in her case, what happened is that the the Prison officials, once they took possession of, of Lin Zhao's writings, no matter how damning they were,、uh, how much atrocity you know, they,、uh, and all the cruel treatments and, and tortures of, of prisoners, how much that has exposed Lin Zhao's writings, exposed, they could not do anything with the writings because the prison rules were that all the inmates' writings had to be put. Into the file, the inmates' file. I mean, these are all politic. They were called counter-revolutionaries, so they would have these files collecting all their of their crimes, evidence of the crime. So Lin Zhao's writings all went into the files as evidence of her crime. But then came, of course, the Mao died in 1976, and in the early years of Deng Xiaoping's reform era, there was an attempt. The party made an attempt to correct some of its mistakes. And because there were so many people who had been wrongly accused, persecuted, or or, or killed, how many、uh, people do you think died? Is there an estimate?、Uh, in addition to the people that died in famines that were caused by the disasters、right. of the Great Leap Forward, we know at least thirty-six million people died from the famine of nineteen、uh, between nineteen fifty-nine, nineteen sixty, sixty-one. For the Cultural Revolution, we don't have a firm figure. The consensus in the historical circles are somewhere between one and two million victims of the Cultural Revolution.、Mm-hmm. So, in the nineteen in the nineteen early nineteen eighties, the party was trying to bring about what was called a political rehabilitation of those who had been wrongly persecuted. And so, the, you have these judges who were assigned to different cases. And I interviewed this judge who was assigned to Lin Zhao's case, and he had. He was responsible. He told me for more than two hundred seventy cases of these wrongful persecutions, and Lin Zhao was just one of those cases. And so he decided to return her prison writings. And he didn't have to do that. Was that part of sort of trying to atone a little bit or to make something right? Because she still had descendants, right? These went back to her family. Yeah,、um, at the time that the judge he could use his、um, his judgment, he could decide what to do with with the papers, and he told me there are two files for each inmate. One was called the primary file, one was the secondary file. The primary file would not be anything in the primary file would not be returned to the to the family. They would. Contain things like the interrogation records. Yeah, so they would, as they're beating people and like interrogating them, and they would keep records of that. And that—that's right. That will go、sealed. into the that will go into the primary, primary file.、Yeah. And I suspect there may be some of Lin Zhao's blood writings that in, are still in、yeah. that primary file. That's still locked away. It's sealed. Is there any hope for that to be unsealed at any point? Well, the party states the their proclaimed rules are that those files will be sealed for fifty years.、Mm-hmm. But then a couple of years back, there were researchers in China who approached officials, say, "Well, wait a minute. They, they are, we, we are now approaching the 50-year time limit."、Uh, the answer was, "Well, we still don't have instructions from above、okay. to do anything." So that's、okay. one file. But then there was a secondary, secondary file, and so the the judge apparently decided that many of Lin Zhao's prison writings could go into the secondary file. Her her blood letters to her mother, for instance. They would go into the um to the secondary file, and there was a this play that Lin Zhao wrote. That was also that doubled as a kind of a journal that she kept. That would also go into the secondary file, and those were returned. Did her mother get those letters that she was trying to send her? I I don't remember it. Her mother did get some of her letters. Lin Zhao at the time writing to her mother, she was never quite sure. Yeah. Whether any of those letters would ever reach her. Her mother, and so she she was sometimes she was surprised that some of those letters did, but not the blood letters.、Mm. She copied after she wrote the blood letters. She would copy everything in ink.、Mm. Okay, so in the 1980s, as you were talking about this, the Chinese government was kind of revisiting the past and trying to reckon with some of the things that had happened in the Shanghai. People's Court in 1981 actually revoked her death sentence. Yes, which is a symbolic gesture. Obviously, what did they hope to accomplish by doing that? Again, it was part of the nationwide effort 
to uh, at our political rehabilitation. So um, if someone was still alive, then there's the hope of getting back your job. So for people who have been already been put to death, at least the, the idea is that your name, your reputation will be rehabilitated. Mm. She had hoped for that. She wanted, if, if she didn't survive, I remember she, she wanted her writings to eventually get to the UN. And as you said, she told her mom she wanted them published. Are the collected letters that, that are actually available, is there a plan to publish a collection of those? Like we have Dietrich Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison. Is there, are there any plans to do a collection of hers? I'm sure many people would like her writings to be published, but there are considerable difficulties. And there are complications that I cannot go, cannot go into. But one thing we do know is that inside China, there is no hope for her writings to be published. So my book was based on this collection of Lin Zhao's writings called Lin Zhao Wenji, or Collected Writings of Lin Zhao. It was put together by um, a group of very dedicated friends and former classmates and, and researchers inside China. So what they were able to do in, in 2013 was to privately print this collection and, and, and circulate that among a very small circle. Was it dangerous oh. for them to do that? I'm not exactly sure. Certainly the government does not like that. On the other hand, there's nothing that's, uh, that's immediately illegal mm -hmm. in, in that act. So it's, I think it's a sort of a gray area. So mm -hmm. it was uh, printed. But what we do also know is that there's no chance whatsoever for such a writing to be formally published inside China. Mm -hmm. What does the communist state think of Lin Chao now to the extent that anyone there is aware of her? Like if they caught wind that a book was being published in, in America, for example. Well, you would think that for someone who has been completely rehabilitated, who has been declared by Shanghai's High People's Court as innocent, whose death sentence has been thrown out, you would think that it is now okay, it is now fine for people to pay their respects to her. But that is not the case. Her tomb is just outside the city of Suzhou, and her tomb has become a pilgrimage site for the democracy activists inside China, particularly since 2004. In that year, a documentary film about Lin Zhao was made. It's called Searching for Lin Zhao's Soul. And it's not formally are released inside China, but it's been circulated among those who care about democracy, about building civil society in China. So ever since then, there has been this annual sort of ritual of people gathering on April 29th, which is the anniversary of her execution, to pay respects to her. And then in recent years, particularly after 2008, which the year of the, of the Beijing Olympics came, People have come each year and the police have shown up dutifully each year to break up the crowd, to, to detain people, to throw some people in, into jail or even. Because it threatens. Uh, Lin Zhao has become a, a symbol that threatens the, the legitimacy of the Communist Party. She, we spoke for a minute, she, before uh, the interview, and we talked a little bit about our backgrounds. And you had mentioned that you are you're a Christian yourself. As a believer, then, you did a project about another Christian, and you published it as an academic book. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts about the intersection between the scholarship you do and the personal faith that you have. Thank you for that question. I, I do find it deeply personal as I worked on this book. And uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which is that um, you know, over the years, there have been lots of articles online inside China about Lin Zhao. But I, I find some real limits in the, the way people commemorate Lin Zhao. One is that they did not have access to her writings, to many of her prison writings. So and that's the limitation. Another limitation is that not too many people realize how important, how essential, how central her faith was to her resistance, this unbending opposition to communism. And as a Christian, I was able to feel that spirit. And of, of course, I have plenty of evidence, her textual evidence, her own writing proving that. I mean, she, she made it very clear that it was because of her Christian faith that she could not bend. And this is something that those who do not have Lin Zhao's faith 
、uh, often fail to appreciate. And so I'm glad that I was able to see the importance and to bring out the importance of a faith in this book. Another thing that struck me is is the tenacity of this young woman's Christian faith under the most、uh, impossible circumstances. You know, in this prison cell that was stripped of any reading material, let alone religious material, any material except for party propaganda, she would conduct what she called "quote grand church service" every Sunday morning, starting. Promptly at nine thirty, singing hymns, reading those biblical passages that she called to mind, and it's the kind of faith that's that's almost un unimaginable to me. But one thing I do know for sure: if we were to put this question to Lin Zhao about how God, whether God has been faithful to her, I think her answer would be absolutely. That God has been faithful to me, that my hope in God was not in vain. That Shi Lian is professor of world Christianity at Duke Divinity School, and author of the new book Blood Letters: The Untold Story of Lin Chao, a Martyr in Mao's China. And again, I want to say, as as we're leaving here, I highly recommend this book. It's a book that I could not put down. Thank you so much for writing this, Shi. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's our pleasure, and I remind people as well that people will be able to see Shi Lian's guest lecture through the Maxwell Institute on our YouTube channel. Thanks for coming in, Shi. Thank you again, and thank you for listening to another episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm looking through some of the reviews that we got in Apple Podcasts over the past month or so. I see one from Ben Shalati that says that the show is excellent, top-notch guests, wonderful content, engaging and insightful. Thanks for that. We have another one here from Ken O. He says the Maxwell Institute podcast is my all-time favorite. I recommend it all the time to friends of my own faith or other religious faiths. Anyone who's interested in religious scholarship can enjoy and learn from this podcast. It's my one-stop shop for enlightening and educational religious conversation. Thanks for that, Ken O. And we love to hear these reviews. We love to hear from listeners. Take some time and review the show on Apple Podcasts. It really helps spread the word about the show. Leave some comments on our Facebook wall or on YouTube or wherever else you listen. And we'll see you next time.